you so much uh, for inviting me here. It's just an honor to be here in India. This is my first time being um, uh, here in the, uh, the country. And um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and to uh, uh, be able to participate in this seminar in part because of all the wonderful presentations that are going to take place um, that I know I'm going to learn a lot from. I'd like to start my presentation by greeting you in my tribal language, which is Choctaw, um, just because I, I always like to, I guess, spread a little Choctaw wherever I go. <laughs> so, is here. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so, Helito, Chima Chukma, Sahachifuya, Dorothy Lippert, Chatasia. Um, Sana Yokpa uh, Chipisa, uh, Repatriation Office, the Tuxalili. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dorothy Lippert. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and I work in the Repatriation Office at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Um, I'm very happy to see you all. I um, I wanted to note uh, having uh, that it's. Um, it's always uh, kind of uh, nerve wracking to follow Larry Zimmerman um, as a presenter because I admire his work so much. Uh, but I think it's fitting in this case because if it hadn't been for Larry's work in uh, anthropology, I probably wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have uh, stuck with the discipline. He, he laid some really strong foundations uh, for the work that I do. Um, and you'll actually see a little bit, I, I'm um, referencing some of his work in the talk today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, repatriation, give you some insights from my work at the Natural History Museum, and actually talk about the, I, the concept of repatriation and how it's being used kind of as a shorthand for something, <laughs> something, I'm not entirely sure what. Um, it's, gonna, it's being used in a, as a metaphor in ways uh, that don't, don't really sit well with me. Um, and so the, the history of repatriation has been described in many places, and I'm not gonna go over all of it um, here today, but I did wanna give you some background uh, to help you all understand exactly how I'm referring to this practice. Um, in the, excuse me, in the United States, um, repatriation is the practice of returning human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony uh, to, from museums and institutions to the indigenous home communities. And in the United States, we have two federal laws that govern repatriation activity. These are the National Museum of the American Indian Act, which was passed in 1990, and the more widely known Native American Grave, I'm, I'm sorry, it's passed in 1989, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, which was passed in 1990, so a year later. Um, in the years since these laws were passed, um, efforts have been made to do the hard work of identifying and returning the ancestors and, and the ancestors' belongings to their relatives. What I've noticed recently is that the term repatriation is beginning to be used in reference to practices that share some aspects of this work, but ultimately cannot be equated with its sensitive, challenging activities. Repatriation is being used as a metaphor for engagement with tribal communities. Other necessary changes, such as decolonization of the pr profession of archeology span may have some intersections as well, um, such as the uh, process of connecting, oh, may have some intersections as well. And the process of connecting tribes with material archeology with material currently being held by museums and archives uh, also shares in these practices. Ultimately, because of its scope, repatriation is a distinct practice. Use of the term when talking about decolonization indicates respect for the work of repatriation, but I think it also reveals some basic misunderstanding about the nature of tribal sovereignty. Use of the term when talking about increasing access to collections held by museums and institutions also in, indicates respect, but dilutes or even misunderstands what is at the heart of this practice. Uh, to be clear, I wholeheartedly support decolonizing work wherever and whenever it takes place. 
I also wholeheartedly support the practice that has been labeled digital repatriation, even though I don't like the term. In this presentation, I'd like to give some background on my work in repatriation and explain why I think it's important to uh, recognize its distinct complexities. A thorough understanding is the foundation for respect. So I've worked since 2001 in the Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of Natural History uh, in the repatriation program. And I've written elsewhere about my experiences uh, in this office and the challenges I've faced as a Choctaw woman um, at the museum. Being one of the very few living Native Americans in the museum reinforces the sense of the museum as a colonized space. I'm also very aware of the, social, the racial and social uh, composition of the bodies who are grouped together uh, in the museum. How those people came to, to be in the museum is striking. It can be distilled into the categories of those who chose to become part of a museum collection and those who did not know that this would happen after their death. And we are all present at the museum together. I had a choice in doing so, and I'm working to help those who did not. Repatriation is provided for the remains of indigenous people generally, and work is underway, currently underway to determine how to work on behalf of ancestral remains of people from other communities. But by dealing with only one group of disrupted persons, repatriation laws fail to acknowledge the role of settler colonialism in producing the problem. When the concept of repatriation was first formalized in law and regulations, the categories of material that could be returned specified Native American human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. These were given specific definitions that were the result of long hours of negotiation. And in the end, the names and definitions are kind of a best possible academic and legal blend of concepts that are applied to non-academic, non-legal terms. Uh, yes, okay. Um, for repatriation, the phrase human remains is fairly uh, descriptive. If the phrase skeletons or bones were, were used, the, these might be equally valid, but non-skeletal material can also be repatriated. However, if someone is not at all related to the human remains under consideration, then it is not obvious that these remains could also be described as relatives or ancestors. A non-native archeologist might refer to the remains as ancestors. Logically, they are somebody's ancestors, even if they're not hers specifically, but this is not the term enshrined in law. The remains are not considered ancestors by NAGPRA or the NMAI Act. A non-native archeologist using the legal terminology is not required to notice that this phrase distances the bones from their relatives. This difference in identity where human beings are either, either collections of skeletons or members of a community can depend on whether one is seeking to relate to the human remains as a professional archeologist or as a descendant community member. Human remains in museum collections are largely those of people who did not intend for this to be their final resting place. Approaching them as individual people raises the question of what this person would have wanted. Identifying them as a collection obscures their individuality. The community of the collected is largely made up of individuals whose relatives lacked the political, economic, or social capital to ensure that their remains stayed where they were placed. I once asked the question this way, who gets taken into the museum? Largely, it's the voiceless, the disempowered, or the impoverished. The terminology used in repatriation reveals how Native people have long been subject to what Adam Zimmer calls definitional violence. Native Americans who are asking for human remains and funerary objects to be returned do not relate to these in the same way as the non-Native museum staff. The human remains and objects are not simply bone and clay, Rather, they are closer to what they, they were when they went into the ground, individuals and personal property. Recasting them as museum collections defines them into another category that may or may not allow them to return to their original identity. Author, oops, I went too far. 
Author Chanam Yeville described the situation brilliantly in his book, Kraken. The book involves a battle between humans, would-be gods, wizards, and supervillains, and a pivotal moment is when all are in the presence of a giant squid that has been stolen from London's Natural History Museum collections and was revered by the Church of Kraken Almighty. Just as the villain is about to bring about the end of the world by accessing the Kraken's ink, the curator of the museum stops him saying, it's not an animal or a god. It didn't exist until I created it. That's my specimen. In a similar way, human beings whose remains were collected and placed in a museum have under, undergone an attempt by scientists to transform them into a different category, that of a collection rather than a community. Mayville go, goes on to describe the reality of the situation. Architeuthis, the giant squid, Billy understood for the first time was not that undefined thing in deep water, which was only ever itself. Architeuthis was a human term. It's ours, he said. In a similar way, the human remains and objects in the museum collections are catalog cataloged, labeled, placed in acid-free boxes and stored. All activities that are appropriate for material meant to be preserved as long as possible. But originally they were not meant to be treated this way. In the case of sacred objects, they were meant to be used, giving their lives for the spiritual benefit of their people. In the case of human remains, they were meant to continue on their journey through the mitigation of Mother Earth. Museum work in, entails classification, beginning with the initial decision that something or someone is appropriate for entry into the collections. Further categories ensue, including deciding on a division, archaeology, ethnology, biological anthropology, assignment of a general name, ceramic vessel, human remains, and eventually possible analysis to provide an anthropological identity, a chickache combed vessel, an adult female, um, and other, other categories. All of this is outside and parallel to the categorization of indigenous in the indigenous community to, who, to whom these people and objects belong. They may be more properly identified as family heirlooms and grandmothers. Like the giant squid, they were only ever themselves. The Santee Dakota poet, songwriter, and activist John Trudell voiced this clearly when he said, we're not Indians and we're not Native Americans. We're older than both categories. We're the people, we're the human beings. But when it comes to repatriation, we must often become human beings again before we return to being people. With repatriation, we are undoing some of the harms of settler colonialism, but there are a lot of structural aspects to repatriation that are tied to colonial practice. Repatriation cannot undo anything, but through it, we can demonstrate our willingness to support the rights of tribes to, can, to care for the ancestors. As an example, I've worked on the repatriation of the human remains of a woman from my own tribe. Our tribal land is in Mississippi. That's the um, uh, it's the it, it's the state with the um, uh, the two rectangles that are inside the one with the lines and, and the, the solid one. Um, that's our original territory. Uh, we were removed uh, from the, the land in 18, um, beginning in 1831. Uh, today, there are three federally recognized Choctaw tribes, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, which is my, my community, the Gina Band of Choctaw in Louisiana, and the Mississippi Band of Choctaw, which are composed of people who resisted the removal and um, uh, stayed behind in the homeland. The woman whose remains we repatriated lived in Alabama, so kind of um, between all of the communities. Today, none of the tribes have title to land in Alabama, uh, so that in order to conduct the repatriation, the, all, th all, of, all three of the tribes work together with the state of Alabama to find a burial place for this woman. So we were able to place her back in the ground somewhat close to where she had originally been buried and her relatives, including myself, were able to be present at her second burial. But she wasn't placed on existing Choctaw land and her body isn't complete in her new grave. 
The army, the US Army surgeon who collected her remains sent only her head to the Army Medical Museum. And so <laughs> that was a very significant uh, repatriation uh, for me to work on. Um, oops. And um, it, it's um, often hard to talk about uh, that particular um, activity. I just wanted to give you a, um, a photo from uh, the My Tribe's Labor Day Festival that's, that happens at uh, the beginning of September every year and uh, show you that um, the tribes are uh, continuing to survive even in Oklahoma, which is where we were, the state we were move, removed to. Um, this is, takes place at the Capitol building that was established after removal. Um, so Choctaw people are, are um, continuing on and uh, we, we have survived many things, um, including um, the actions that led to this repatriation. So all of this kind of brings me to my, um, my first issue. Repatriation is often noted as an example of decolonization within the museum world. And I'd like to argue that um, the example that I just gave demonstrates the limits of repatriation to achieve true decolonization. Um, while aspects of the work involve acknowledging the sovereignty of tribal nations and the limits of archeological and museum authority, um, the, it, through the repatriation procedures, authorities given to non-indigenous entities to make decisions regarding cultural relationships. The differences in repatriation experiences for tribes, for tribes between different museums and universities. So tribes will work, um, tribes may have to work with a number of different museums and universities to repatriate ancestors because um, so many different uh, people went out and collected human remains. But tribes working will, will have different experiences depending on um, the approach taken by that particular institution. Uh, there's, there's not really a universal agreement that repatriation is the right thing to do. And so some places um, are more resistant um, to um, following the law, the laws. Um, uh, um, Ray Gould calls it um, institutional will. A university or, or museum may have institutional will uh, to conduct repatriation, and that's what, um, what makes the process happen. So if repatriation were truly decolonized, the authority to conduct the work would rest in indigenous hands. Um, a decolonized process would recognize that tribal expertise is primary, uh, given the tribes were the ones with relationships uh, to the remains and objects under request. And um, I recognize here, I'm, I'm already um, kind of going over things that other people have said earlier today, so I, I, um, I can kind of see how this you know, is all fitting very well together. Um, Non-Indigenous archaeologists I've often found uh, sometimes experience a sense of relationship with the peoples and communities that they study. Um, I think that this can be beneficial because a sense of relationship often brings uh, a great level of respect and can build trust. But the academic tradition can lead someone from a sense of relationship through to a sense of ownership. And this get ex gets expressed by archaeologists when they talk about my site or my artifacts, my, my people that I'm studying. Um, even for Native people who share cultural affiliation with remains and objects being repatriated, uh, there's no sense of ownership. <laughs> we, don't, we don't think of um, ownership when it comes to human remains uh, or funerary objects. Um, we are relatives and those are our ancestors. The funerary objects we repatriate are their belongings. Um, even when working with artifacts, we recognize that the, the items under examination belong to someone else. Um, in identifying the remains and objects as theirs, um, I think archeologists are uh, enacting a second colonization of indigenous territory. To counteract this, uh, training in indigenous archeology span foregrounds indigenous sovereignty. It emphasizes that archeologists are working with, not on indigenous communities. 
Turning to my second area of concern, the phrase digital repatriation is often used to uh, describe the transfer of material electronically between museums and tribes. Um, I was kind of horrified to see that there's actually a Wikipedia page um, dedicated to this. Um, it's, it's not the practice, it's the phrase digital repatriation uh, that's been a source of frustration to me. Uh, the activities that describes uh, you know, that fall under digital repatriation, providing images, texts, um, elect electronically created media, um, their websites, their databases, um, there's, you know, 3D imaging, um, you know, uniting objects in collections with uh, tribal communities. Uh, you know, I think that's, that all those things are, are great. Um, but again, I also don't think this is a decolonized practice. Um, my strong concern is over the inclusion of the word repatriation. The practice, the practices that fall under digital repatriation uh, don't come close to, um, to approaching the return of unique materials such as a human skeleton. A digital image can be sent to innumerable people or can be accessed on the web by anyone with the correct um, address. In my repatriation work, for the National Museum of Natural History, I've repatriated the remains of individuals whose names we have known. I've repatriated the remains of individuals from my own tribe. I've repatriated the remains of individuals who, who had living family members, who, um, uh, I've repatriated the remains of young children. Um, it makes me angry to think that anyone can believe that sharing a photograph online can approach the challenges that tribes and anthropologists face when working with repatriation. Sharing a song that may have been lost to a tribe is certainly important work, but because a museum can be able to share, to send a copy to more than one person in the tribe or a copy to more than one anthropologist, um, that work should not be titled so that it references the often painful work of repatriation. Uh, sharing pictures, videos, and, and texts is wildly easy uh, compared with um, accomplishing um, the return of human remains. For Native people who work to repatriate, um, oh, um, I like to put this photo in um, uh, my presentations because it, it gives me kind of a a break when I'm thinking about the work that I've done. This is um, a repatriation that was incredibly difficult and, and challenging. Every aspect of it was, was hard to work on. But when it was all over, when it was everything had been um, finished, uh, the, the tribal member who had traveled to the museum sent me this image and said, I, I just wanted you to see where, where he's been buried. Um, and so, you know, we're not looking at his gravesite. We're just looking at a, a general um, picture that that he wanted me to see. And I, um, I look at it and I think it's so green and beautiful. And um, it just makes me glad to to remember that and to think about um, that child going home. Okay. Um, so I've, I've kind of been alluding to this. <laughs> For Native people who work to repatriate ancestral remains, there's this kind of stratigraphy of impacts that exists, this kind of a weight uh, that we all carry. Um, we know what the histories of our peoples are, um, and we label, we label, <laughs> we labor with the burden of ancestral trauma. Um, speaking for myself, it wasn't until I'd stayed home for two years <laughs> during the COVID pandemic uh, and then returned to the museum collections facility that I understood how much effort it took to be around um, the, the Native American human remains in the collections. Um, the simple act of going to work every day can carry burdens for Indigenous people that are not obvious or not felt um, by non-Natives. Another of my concerns is, um, hmm. so this is um, this is just showing you um, what the um, 
I think this was meant to go with the, the previous um, paragraph. It's just showing you what our collections facility looks like at uh, the Museum Support Center at the Smithsonian. This is um, the pod four, which is oversized um, storage. So there, there are no, no human remains um, or funerary objects in there. Um, so another of my concerns is um, that you know, once you digitally repatriate a photograph or a, um, a 3D image, uh, you can repatriate it to anybody you want. You can send it to, um, uh, to anyone. But once you repatriate a human skeleton um, and it's reburied, that person continues on the journey uh, that was interrupted by anthropologists. Um, by definition, when you repatriate someone, they return to their own country. Um, the person can't be repatriated again. Um, and it seems to be that it's the electronic element, uh, the electronic aspect of this work that made people think they needed a new phrase to describe um, what's, what's going on. Because you know, previous work um, was achieved just through making physically making copies. So you know, going into a dark room and making copies of a photograph and then sending them to a, a tribal community. Um, or making casts, um, physical casts of objects uh, and sending these to communities. And there wasn't, there wasn't really a term that was given to that practice, um, you know, making replicas or sharing items, but there was no need to label it as, um, as digital repatriation. I think the idea came about after repatriation, um, the laws had been passed and the, the practice had been ongoing that um, people got this idea, oh, um, you know, we'll, we'll call it, <laughs> we'll call this practice, you know, something, something new and reference, um, reference work with tribal communities. Um, so I'm, I, it, I'll note it's hard to find um, Im appropriate images to use when you're talking about um, working with sacred items. And this is from an article that was in the New York Times. Um, so digital repatriation of objects implies that sharing an electronic copy of an item can equate to the actual return of something that's vital for tribal survivance. Um, there are three repatriation categories for so-called objects. Funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. Um, the importance and significance of these items is reflected by their inclusion in the repatriation laws. Um, it's hard to convey sometimes what uh, such items can mean, but um, I'd like to describe to you a repatriation that I observed. Um, the, the museum had returned sacred items to a tribe. And this went about in our, our regular practice. So um, tribal members uh, traveled to the museum and we all sat down and um, had a formal uh, signing ceremony for the deaccession paperwork. And um, people sat down, everyone, you know, the museum workers were in their best suits and um, we signed papers, in, you know, multiple copies in multiple places. Um, we spoke about, uh, respect for the tribe, the tribe spoke about the importance of the return. Um, you know, everyone shook hands and drank coffee afterwards. It was, you know, very businesslike. But after it was all over, the, the tribal members were able to treat the items as they were supposed to be treated. Uh, they wrapped them very carefully um, in material that they had brought. Um, I watched one person sweep an item into her arms, just lift it up and, and, and bring it to her. Um, and she, she cradled it you know, so gently, like it was a child, like it was a child. Um, and when she carried it out of the museum, you know, her whole posture was just radiant. Um, and I, I can hardly imagine that um, a tribe on the other side of a digital repatriation would have that same, um, same sense of impact. Um, so let me, let me move, oh, um, that was to illustrate a repatriation. Let me move uh, through to the end. <laughs> Um, 
And so there I was, I was referencing uh, Larry Zimmerman's work with the, the Crow Creek repatriation, where he talked about the importance of working with the, the tribal community, despite what you might want to do anthropologically. Um, it's important to um, be working closely with the tribe. Um, this is another um, slide I wanted to, to show that talks about um, authenticity of an item. And this is a, muse a mini museum that you can purchase. These are small pieces of items. Uh, you can't tell what the items are, um, but you're told, you know, this is a, a small piece of a Roman sword. This is a small piece of a mummy wrapping. Um, and so it, it's the, that you have the actual item that makes this something that someone would pay, you know, hundreds of dollars for. Um, I'm thinking about it in, in reference to digital repatriation where you're getting a copy of something, um, but it's only a, it's only a copy. So um, in, in summary, I, I really hope that this hasn't come off as just a, a rant about the use of the word repatriation. Um, I sometimes think I'm just too close to the practice and feel like I've poured too much of my life into it. Um, and it makes me protective of the term, even if I'm critical of the process. Um, but what I've presented is the idea that um, names, uh, names matter. Um, a human being cannot be the same thing as an artifact. The skeleton of an indigenous person uh, should not automatically be identified as the source of museum capital. Repatriation is the, the return of someone to their own country. Um, under US federal law, it's something that happens between nations. Um, my, um, my point is that as an indigenous, uh, as indigenous people, we are already working under the weight of history. Um, we need for decolonization to take place. We need for museums to collaborate with tribes and returning access to information and objects and collections. And we need repatriation to actually take place, not just metaphorically. Thank you.